Been a crazy week of chess in the Magnus Carlsen Tour final, and Hikaru and Magnus squared off today for the grand finale. Hikaru's got the white pieces, series tied 3-3, and once again we began with a Berlin defense. This time, Hikaru went back to a system that he's seen many times, and so has Magnus, uh, with h3, keeping the position flexible and not yet committing uh, what side of the board he's going to play on. Knight d7 from Magnus guards the center. We have knight c4, a5. Some early developments where Magnus begins to play very actively on the queen side. We have bishop e3, fe3, and a4. And here, Hikaru started mobilizing on the king side. So he brought his queen and his knights this way. And I was trying to hypothesize what his plan was going to be during the live broadcast. I thought he was going to play something like rook f3, rook g3, maybe queen g4. Um, but it turned out that all he was doing here was gluing the knights together, and he was looking for a potential d4 break. And so we had king h8 and d4, and he had to play this because otherwise he would have been hit with bishop c4 and a pin. So we get takes, 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 big trade in queen c6. And here, Ikaru moved his rook. And at the time of the game, it, it obviously, it, you know, he, he didn't miss the a2 pawn being unguarded. But I was trying to figure out exactly what was, what was the thought process here. Was he going to try to win back the b5 pawn? Was he going to try to trap the bishop? He went for the attempt to trap the bishop. Well, in playing b3, we got rook d8, and now there is a bit of a problem. Because if you take on a4, uh, the bishop gets out, the pawn takes, and there's a promotion. Uh, and it's not so easy to guard here and get out of this pin. The engine here gave an absolutely ridiculous saving idea to play rook d2. So now the queen is guarding the rook, but more importantly, when the rook takes the rook, it's not a check anymore. That's the problem, is that if this knight moves and the rook takes the rook, I just take your queen. And so if a3 here, with the idea of moving the bishop and just promoting, knight takes b5 is the saving move. Ridiculous. Rook d2, queen c5 with queen f8 mate. If you take the queen, I have to get my rook out of danger. There is no back rank mate because I'm in check. And then I'm threatening to take on a3. So a pretty ridiculous position here, uh, and you have to find the move knight takes b5, uh, and in the game instead of this we got knight f5, but Magnus played takes, takes, and was just able to take the pawn. And uh, you cannot take it, there's still some tactical opportunities, Hikaru went all in, sacrificing on g7, looking for king g7, a discovered attack which would win the queen, but Magnus immediately chops off a, uh, a rook of his for two knights, and this is winning because there's no discovered check which wins the game. Now if you play rook d7, you get knight d7. And this is winning at the super grandmaster level because you have a knight and a bishop for a rook, not to mention the fact that you have the two pass pawns on the queen side. So what Magnus does is he consolidates his position, gets his king to safety, surrounded by his pieces, and slowly begins to expand the pawns, which resulted in Hikaru resigning the game on move 43, as there is no way into the king, and slowly these pawns will go down the board, and the match began 1-0 with Hikaru losing with the white pieces. So in the second game, every, there was this big question, you know, was Magnus going to repeat? Was he just going to make a draw and, and give Hikaru the, uh, the third game? And he played e4, and Hikaru played the Sicilian defense, which was obviously a bit surprising. In fact, playing into knight f3, knight c6, which is kind of what Magnus has been playing all the time, we got a Rosalimo, bishop b5 rather than g4, and then there was g6, which is a mainline position. But Magnus played this in like e4, e5 style. He played uh, c3, and then didn't actually like try to do anything crazy in the center of the board, so the position became rather symmetrical. And this sort of is the summary of the game. The game was 74 moves long, and both players kind of shuffled their pieces around, traded a little bit, and you see like everything gets traded off. Uh, there was a little bit of a of a hiccup in the rook end game. You know, both both players brought their rooks to the open file. If you need any sort of mini lesson from this game, but not a terribly exciting second game, and in my opinion, went on a lot longer uh, than it potentially should have. Magnus putting some pressure here. Rooks are very active, but not enough weaknesses in Hikaru's position to do anything about it, and it resulted in an end game where. Uh, it was Hikaru who got bishop and two pawns uh, versus bishop and two pawns. Uh, even if you lose the pawn, you have a defensive fortress. It's impossible to win the h6 pawn for white, and it's impossible to promote. And, well, the next, like, literally 30 moves are basically just shuffling the pieces. And if I jump forward to move 70, 
know, right, right around here. Magnus was able to push his pawn further, and we did get king f5. Uh, but then we got bishop f4, takes, and bishop h6, simply resulting in a draw. So, relatively boring and straightforward second game, even with the Sicilian on the board. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing too complicated, but Magnus always a little bit of pressure. And now it was back to Hikaru for the third game with a one-point deficit. Another Berlin. A variation that you've seen a lot. You've seen, you've heard me say the word Berlin. Some of you have resorted to only writing Berlin in the comments. Uh, literally, there was a guy who wrote like seven Berlins. It was flagged by YouTube's comment algorithm as spam. But in this position, Hikaru did not put anything on e3. He played g4. And this, this is, this is, this is why we're here. Hikaru's got a win with the white pieces, and he disregards king safety playing the move g4. He then plays rook g1, and essentially says to Magnus, I'm going to throw my g and h pawns at you. Good luck. Get a4, knight back to e3, a trade and knight of fate. And he says h4, and h5. Not castling, keeping his king in the center, probably the safest spot for it, considering the fact that if you castle queenside, you're just going to get your king in more trouble with the a and the b pawns. Then we have b5, knight h4, and we see this maneuver once again, anticipating that if this trade occurs, this just opens up the rook, and white is completely winning, because white's just going to get a huge attack. Like, you're not going to be able to stop my attack. Magnus tried to play c4, and here, this blob of light squared pawns allows the move queen before to happen. Magnus tries to create some counterplay. Hikaru stabilizes rather than trading the pawn and creating a weakness. Now here we get queen c2. Big moment here in the game. Very big moment. Uh, Hikaru has to deal with the danger of the queen jumping in. And he finds the move h6, g6, and rook c1, playing on both sides of the board, creating some dark squared weakness, not allowing the king to escape off of the back rank. And taking this pawn is frankly too dangerous because again, it opens up the rook. So queen takes d3. Here there was two wins. The first win was knight e7, uh, just jumping in and getting this kind of a position, threatening queen f6, queen g7, at the same time rook c7, at the same time queen e5 and queen g7 and all these ideas. But Hikaru chose another way, rook d1, queen c2, and knight to g7, and the rook is trapped. Just trapped. It cannot move here, it cannot move here, it cannot move here, taken on every square. So bishop b7. During the game, Sessi freaked out here, and obviously everybody in the viewing audience saw it, saying that bishop takes g4 was saving, somehow. You sacrifice the piece, and then you move this rook out of danger, and all of a sudden you are the one creating a threat. If rook d8, rook d8, and even though white is up a bishop, this rook is not doing a damn thing anymore, and rook d1 is basically checkmate, white has to do some crazy running, and even if you play king f1, there is a queen d1 check. So, super, super dangerous position if you allow this. Uh, the best move is to not even take this. Uh, it's to play like rook d2, you know, just try to get your opponent to like go here and queen d2 and try to stabilize. Wild position, but it was Magnus playing bishop b7. And after a trade and f3, this position, a nice little idea. If you take my queen, I make a new one. So queen c3, rook a8. But now I can take the queen because the rook used to protect the e-pawn before it moved to a8. Now it takes, takes, and queen e5. And it was here. Magnus resigned the game, and it was all level. And he resigned because there's no way to prevent mate on this diagonal. If you play knight e6, stopping queen g7, I play bishop d4, and it does not matter that you can take my bishop, because I have two different mates, and you cannot stop both of them. So we go to game four. Magnus has white, opens with c4, something that has been fruitful for him, and we get an English opening, a variation that we've seen Magnus play a lot. Now again, this game was not terribly exciting. Uh, there was a lot of maneuvering early on. Again, both sides got all their pieces to the center, and Magnus tried to play queen c4 and create something on, uh, on the queen side. But he was unable to do so. Uh, Hikaru played relatively straightforward moves, uh, just solidified, and finally launched this f-pawn forward. And then there was a mass trade. So there was some captures, 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 and rook e6, knight e4, and a4. So white is down a pawn, but has terribly active pieces, like in a good way. Not, you know, terribly active for, for somebody trying to defend this with the black position. Um, very, very unpleasant, but in winning back a pawn, you know, I told you this game wasn't going to be terribly thrilling. Uh, again, for the next 20 moves, the rooks were shuffling around, and then something really funny happened here, 
where both sides started chopping off all the pawns. Doot, doot, shuffling around, shuffling around, shuffling around. We got a promotion to a knight. And then all the pawns got traded. Rooks got traded. And uh, you have to know your king and pawn endgames. But this is simply a draw. And we go to blitz. First game of the, of the blitz. Hikaru's got the white pieces. We have another anti-Berlin. And we have an early capture on c6 and d4 from Hikaru. So Hikaru goes for a position where his queen is out early. And Magnus has to take a damage to his pawn structure on the queen side. For a trade of pieces. Now, he's relying on the fact that long term, the opposite colored bishops are going to give him high drawing chances. And he's not wrong, but the position is incredibly difficult to defend. Hikaru develops some pieces, and then here, scoops up the c pawn. And that proved to actually be very difficult to defend. So Magnus created this little defensive barrier, a4 and c5, and that prevents these pawns from moving forward. If you play b3, I'm going to take. If you play c3 or c4, I'm going to take. However, there's still weaknesses. And the golden rule to winning some sort of endgame with two rooks and a bishop, two rooks and a knight, you will hear coaches say this, you should trade one rook. You should not trade two rooks. You should trade one rook. That is something that helped out a lot here. One of the rooks got traded, and then Hikaru took care of his only weakness with his king, and activated his pawn structure on the other side to weaken Magnus's bishop. And here Magnus ha cannot continue to defend his pawns. His bishop is not optimally placed, so he went for a pawn sacrifice on c5, rook e3. And now I ask you, what is the biggest strength of white's position? Correct. It is the pass pawns on the queen side. So you have to play b4. You do not need to defend these pawns. You don't need to play f4. You don't need to play h4, h5. You just need to play b4. Takes, takes. And that's exactly what decided the game. The pushing of the a pawn. And here the nice spatial barrier created by the bishop. Bishop e4, a7. And well, there is uh, no way that you are going to stop these pawns. And here a nice little maneuver. You can make a queen. But rather than making a queen, what you do is you give... Rook e8 to the opponent to try to trade this bishop for the rook so that you can promote successfully. And if bishop f3, now you take the pawn. Since king takes f5, we'll be met with rook f8 check and rook takes f3. Normally rook is bad for a bishop, but when you're guaranteed a queen at the end of it, it's not such a bad decision after all. And so we got king f7, and because of the nature of the two pass pawns, Magnus in this position was forced to resign since the bishop will come back stop both of these pawns in the event of a rook trade, and Hikaru took a 1-0 lead, a draw away from clinching the title. Sixth game, potentially the last. We got c4 from Magnus, e5, and a four knights with d5. Four knights English, I should say, with d5. Hikaru plays d5, something that we've seen before, and queen to c2. Knight b4, queen b1, and around this point, the position became a reverse... Oh, I should play before this. It's a reverse Sicilian. It's as if Black is playing the Scheveningen, I believe, is the, uh, is, is the structure. It's like, you know, you, you've created the structure. We sometimes see Black with the structure. Uh, but Magnus just trying to do something. His game plan here was to keep pieces on the board because he has to win. And that's kind of what he did. He did it pretty successfully. He, in this position, brought the knight back to e1. Hikaru didn't want to trade. And it's important to note here that Magnus was down almost two minutes on the clock. So queen f6, knight d3. Hikaru just bringing all his pieces to the party, and essentially the big question is, who is going to break through and where? And it was right around here that Hikaru threw a punch. Not really, but he's trying to break up the structure, while Magnus jumps in with the knight to c5. And a big decision, do you take on b4, or do you take on c5 first? Hikaru went like this. Now the difference between the two is if this happens, the pawn gets to a4, and at least you can lock in the bishop on b3 and claim to have a barrier. The way it happened in the game, you still get the knight to d4, but there's no a pawns. And despite the opposite colored bishop endgame, this position is pretty difficult to defend. So Magnus takes on e5, c7, g7, potential weaknesses along the 7th rank. Here, there was a saving move for Hikaru, which probably would have secured him the half point. That move being bishop d1. And the point is that the rook is hit, and here, bishop takes f3, 
King g1, you can't take, that would be tragic, but you play something like h6, and life is good, you win the pawn. Bishop d1 is brutal to find, and by the way, it's not even the end of the story if I sacrifice my rook to win this pawn, and then you have to deal with all of these pawns. But it's easier to defend than what happens in the game, because after rook f3, Magnus goes on the initiative on the other side of the board, picks up a pawn, and starts to break through. And there is nothing that you can do in time to stop this pawn, and just a few moves later, this position, Hikaru called it a game. Excuse me, let me draw that arrow a little bit better. He called it a game. 3-3, three 3-3 to three, three to three overall, and it comes down to Ar Armageddon. Last time Magnus chose white, this time he learned from his mistakes, he chose the black pieces. 5 for Hikaru, 4 for Magnus. Let's see what happens. I mean, Berlin. Same position that we got. And remember that since there's no increment, stability favors one of the sides. So both players castled queenside, right? Hikaru doesn't care about winning the game so drastically. He cares about stabilizing the position and maintaining a time advantage, especially with no bonus time. Flagging is part of it. And if you decide to uh, play with four minutes, that's one of the risks that you run. So knight h5. And here I liked Hikaru's position uh, because it's really difficult for one of the sides to create play here. As long as you stabilize, you don't let the opponent jump in, it's going to be very simple and straightforward. But when the knight started rotating this way, it allowed Magnus to play a really cool idea. He played knight h4, the idea being that if you do nothing, because the threat's not really here, cover it, to go g5. And the point of g5 is that I will now maneuver my knight back, kick away your knight, and mobilize with the h-pawn. That's exactly what happened in the game, and Magnus opened up the h-file with h5. Hikaru stabilized the position, Magnus brought in his rook. Hikaru fought him on this flank, doubling his rooks. After rook h1, b3, Magnus spotted that this move blocks the bishop, but weakens the a-pawn, and played c4. At this point, it's about minute and 50 for Magnus, about 2.30 for Hikaru, up 40 seconds. We get dc4, queen a3, and Hikaru plays g5, looking to break through on that side of the board. Apparently here, rook g1, rook g1, fg5, uh, and you can't take, because rook h1, and even though you can cover up, I have queen d6, and it's going to be really difficult to stop this. But in the game, we just got something a little bit more straightforward, and Magnus went for a5. Still a dream position, because you're trying to stabilize and not allow the opponent to get anything. So here, there's very little play, and one of the players is down 30 seconds. We get knight a4, queen d6, queen c3, bishop d7, and we get rook h3. Rook h3 doesn't quite create a threat, so rook d1, queen e7. And that pawn is weak. That pawn is weak. Knight d3, and if rook f3, spoiler alert, that's actually exactly what happens in the game. Here there was maybe the biggest chance, uh, a very subtle idea that doesn't by any stretch of the imagination win the game for white, but would have put a little bit of pressure, the move c5. And you cannot take this with the queen, because the bishop is not guarded at the end. And if you take it with the pawn, I free up this square, I jump in with my knight, this is weak, 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 everything is weak, and that's a problem. But black also doesn't have to take the pawn, black can play like here, and uh, it would still be a little bit challenging because you would take on b6 and the game would go on. But knight d3 played... And, uh, well, Magnus plays the only move that looks like he can't play. He, he plays rook f3. Because he's not going to play queen e5, queen e5, knight e5. That would blunder a piece. That would lose the game. He finds an idea here that's very clever. Rook takes knight. He gets rid of the defender of the queen. And even though you get a queen, he takes with check. And rook and bishop versus queen, when all the pawns are on the same side of the board, will probably result in a fortress. Even though Magnus said he famously doesn't believe in them, it doesn't really matter because sometimes they just exist. The players give away both pawns, because obviously you have to stop this. You trade one more pawn off with something like, you know, b4 potentially, which is going to happen in a second, b4. But the two on two, you just can't break through because black plays b5 right on time. And you don't win the rook with queen d5. And slowly but surely, the players reach this position, which is a fortress defense for Magnus. It's completely equal, it is a draw, but Hikaru up 20 seconds on the clock, about 40 seconds to a minute, plays a little bit longer just to play it out, but ultimately offered a draw, draw agreed in this position on move 67, 
rather than trying to have some sort of ridiculous finish with a with a, you know just shuffling the queen around it could not get any closer but ultimately magnus with the black pieces draws the armageddon game therefore winning the match four to three in the closest of margins and well what more to say what an unbelievable match uh theory paved in all sorts of different openings c4 d4 e4 whether you're a supporter of hikaru or a supporter of magnus or just a cheer you know a cheerer for for chess in general this is everything we could have asked for so it's been amazing making these recaps for all of you if you've made it this far in the video uh and you know shout out to my shout out to the live audience we're actually watching this right now too um it's been awesome uh there's i'm going to try to do this more in the future with high level events let me know your thoughts on the entire event whether you think rapid chess or blitz chess is the future and uh well i'll see you uh in whatever next video that i decide to make and subscribe if you haven't already peace